hatred, bloodshed, and vengeance unshackled in Israel and Gaza. As the U.S. moves massive military might to the region, can anything be done to limit catastrophic destruction and loss of life? At the state capitol, a major move to counter the tide of illegal immigration. Will empowering Texas cops to lock up the undocumented discourage additional millions from crossing? And here at home, the state cracks down on a controversial affordable housing complex surrounded by toxic contamination. Will new testing uncover incompetence and corruption at Houston's Housing Authority? I'm Greg Grugan, and welcome to Watch Your Point, where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, former Houston City Council member Sue Lovell. Next up, Bob Price, associate editor of Breitbart, Texas. In the three spot, Holly Hansen, political writer for The Texan. Batting cleanup, well known businessman and columnist for Real Clear Politics, Bill King. And closing us out, Marcus Davis, highly regarded restaurateur and host of Fish, Grits, and Politics. Let's begin. We're going to make sure other hostile actors in the region know that Israel is stronger than ever and prevent this conflict from spreading. Down on America's support for Israel. As the Jewish state continues to mass troops for a ground invasion of Gaza in retaliation for the October 7th slaughter of 1,400 Israeli civilians in a brutal surprise attack by Hamas militants. In the days since, more than 3,700 Palestinians have been killed in counterattacks, a death toll almost certain to rise exponentially. As hostilities with Hezbollah intensify on Israel's northern border, the United States has dispatched an extraordinary amount of firepower to the region, including two aircraft carriers, two cruisers, eight destroyers, and five frigates. The president has asked Congress to approve a military aid package totaling $100 billion to bolster Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Hamas and Putin represent different threats but they share this in common. They both want to completely annihilate a neighboring democracy, completely annihilate it. Hamas, to state of purpose for existing, is the destruction of the state of Israel and the murder of Jewish people. Panel, there are few topics more divisive as we've witnessed in demonstrations and counter protests across this country, although multiple polls confirm a substantial majority of Americans are standing solidly behind Israel. And with that, we're going to open our conversation. Uh, Marcus Davis, I know you have strong feelings about this. Uh, I do. I do. I do. I have strong feelings about this because I have strong feelings about America. And to the American people, I think we are in tremendous danger right now. I don't think we're helping ourselves in this region. Let's start with the opening that President Biden stated, which was that Israel is stronger than ever. And that's just absolutely not true. If they were stronger than ever, then this attack would have been seen and it would have been thwarted. If they were stronger than ever, then we would have seen more stability in the region. They're stronger than ever because of your opening, Greg. Mm -hmm. We are sending massive amounts of military equipment and massive amount of money into this region. And what we're doing right now is dangerous for America because we are emboldening others that do not like us. We're inviting more terroristic behavior our way. We are disassociating ourselves with any opportunity for relationship with Muslim, Arab countries in that region, and we're encouraging more terror. And I'm afraid for my children with us digging our heels in in this manner. Supporting the humanitarian people that are there that are innocent victims is one thing, but us sending packages, us sending money, us sending <clears throat> military, us basically engaging in the possibility of a third world war is frightening. All right, Bob Price, you've served our nation, and uh, you follow geopolitics. Uh, how do you see this? Well, I will say that, yes, we are in a very scary place for the United States of America, and we have invited more terrorism to be taken against us. Uh, that said, we are doing the right thing and standing behind Israel. Unfortunately, Joe Biden set the stage for this attack on Israel to happen. The allowing of, of 
Iran to sell additional oil, to the ignoring of, of many of the sanctions that were put in place against Iran, all of these things that, that raised money that has been given to Hezbollah, that has been given to Hamas to attack Israel, and to see this slaughter, I mean, I don't see how anyone can stand beside Hamas. If you're standing beside Hamas, you're standing for terrorism. The, the acts that were taken against these civilians, going into their homes and slaughtering people, dragging naked women through the streets, raping women, murdering children, burning people alive, attacking youth at a, at a concert, and that was their intention. These aren't, these aren't collateral damages of a strategic bombing campaign. These are intended targets of these terrorists in, in there. Uh, thank goodness that we have two U.S. carrier task force sitting in the Gulf to keep this from spreading, but it should have never happened in the first place, and that's on Joe Biden. All right, Holly, I know you're a student of history. I went back, you know, 1947, the U.N. partitions. There's supposed to be two states here. Instead, we have an all-out fight of extermination. This two years after the end of the Holocaust. Uh, forces attack the Israeli set settlers from all sides. They fight them off. They retaliate. I mean, you know, give us your perspective on this. I've been fighting for decades, but literally thousands of years. I, I was just going to say, you know, if we're going to look at the histor history of this region, we have to go back to, you know, ancient Rome. We have to look at 70 AD and what's been going on since then. I mean, this has been going on for thousands of years. Uh, a book I recommend, late great historian Paul Johnson wrote a history of the Jews, which is fantastic. Um, but you really have to understand the dynamics. I do want to expand on something Bob said. It's not just the Biden administration's actions in regards to Iran that led to this. There are actions that were taken in the very first days of the Biden administration that set up this scenario, not only with the Middle East, but with the Russian-Ukraine conflict. And it's not just poor foreign policy. There are There is energy policy that has played into this. And in the early days of the Biden administration, they signaled that the U.S. was going to oppose their own domestic oil and gas producers, allowing Russia and Iran to expand in the market. And it gave them more funds, more control. Plus, we signaled that we're not serious about defending areas of the country, botched withdrawal of Afghanistan and so forth. These things matter. And it's incredibly naive to assume that everyone else in the world thinks the way Americans do. There are very hostile nations hostile actors, and we need a serious foreign uh, foreign policy and energy policy. All those work together. Bill, uh, I would assume you believe there are plenty of blame to go around. 45 seconds final. I'm going to have to agree with all my esteemed <laughs> colleagues and friends here. Uh, look, I think to blame the Biden administration on this is just wrong. This is something going on for thousands of years, decades. You know, it turns out the $6 billion everybody screamed about was actually oil that was sold to Korea under an exception that Trump granted for that money to be sold. So look, there's plenty of blame to go around here. My advice to the Israelis, if they were to ask me, is there's an old saying that revenge is best served cold. And I think rushing into Gaza right now would be a mistake. I think they need to think about this very strategically. And look, at the end of the day, we've got to have a solution for the people of Gaza if this is ever going to be, if there's ever going to be peace in that region. I agree with that. Still to come, transforming every cop in Texas into immigration agents. Can it stem the flow of undocumented entry? And in our Sunday survey, we're asking viewers if local police should have the authority to arrest people for being here illegally. Tell us what you think. Vote on our webpage, fox26houston.com. Just click on poll at the top of the page or tell 26 using our news app. But up next, after a week of fruitless campaigning, the man who would be speaker folds and the House remains leaderless. After losing three consecutive votes, Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan has dropped his bid to succeed Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker. Jordan's defeat comes despite the full endorsement of former President Donald Trump. In the meantime, the House remains leaderless and the legislative branch of our government completely paralyzed. Panel, sadly, it continues to be a clinic and how not to run a democracy. 
Is that too harsh, Bob? No, that's not harsh enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not. You know, um, Matt Gates has created chaos in the House of Representatives at a time when we need the House of Representatives to do its work. Um, three Texas congressmen stood in the way of Jim Jordan getting getting the nod, and uh, Kay Granger and, and uh, Tony Gonzalez, to name two of the the other guy from Midlothian. I can't ever remember his name, but um, it. We need a Speaker of the House. This is the second person in line behind the succession to the President of the United States. Uh, there's serious business that has to be done in the House. Uh, Pete Sessions is being dis discussed now as a possible Speaker candidate. I, I would hate to see that, but there are some good people, including the Louisiana Congressman Johnson. All right, you're a great strategist. <laughs> I think so. Anyway, I mean, you know, uh, the Democrats have made their point. We got a business to take care of in this country. Can they not rally around a moderate who, who you know, might not get the, the whole caucus, but we have business to take care of. Well, be, they're not taking care of the business of the people. They're taking care of the business of their own agenda, why they got elected, and, um, and it's hurting the country. Look, I'm all for, you know, hey, my, my nominee would be Kay Granger, who stood up this week and stood against it, and is a really good, a good mayor of, Fort, uh, of from Fort Worth area, not a mayor, but a congressperson. You know, if, if Kay Granger could be nominated from Texas, which would be great, I think maybe you could get the Democrats possibly to come around, um, but it's got to be someone that's going to be moderate. But no, this is just, um, th this is a clown car. All right. I, I am not going to uh, exclude Marcus Davis from coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, the, the, I, I opened by talking about the danger that America is in. This is even more evidence that the danger America is in. I, for the X number of years that I've been on this program, I have talked a uh, considerable amount about partisan politics. I have repeated and regurgitated the words of George Washington talking about what would happen to a nation if we picked two parties and we dug, we dug our heels in with each Amen. party. And here we are today, 535 people responsible for the governing of our country cannot get it together. It's not just the Republicans. Yes, they led the charge with M Matt Gates, but it's the Republicans and the Democrats. And, you know, one hand, you know, one hand backhands the other, and the American people suffer. All right, we're going to leave it there. When we come back, the campaign in Austin to give every cop in Texas legal authority to arrest the undocumented. All right. House Bill 4 is a landmark bill that allows Texans to protect Texas and to send illegal immigrants back and to prosecute and incarcerate those that refuse to leave. State Representative David Spiller laying out a fairly radical response to the ongoing border crisis. If approved, the measure would empower all Texas law enforcement officers to arrest undocumented immigrants and return them to a port of entry. HB 4 also establishes criminal penalties, including incarceration for those who repeatedly enter Texas illegally. Panel this week, Governor Greg Abbott added Spiller's bill and other similar legislation to the special session call. All right, Bob, uh, is, is this legit? Would it help? And uh, is it legal? Well, first off, you, this may surprise you, but this is feel-good legislation. Mm -hmm. Th this is not going to be effective. Uh, there, immigration law is a very complicated thing, and you go arresting people that might you might think are illegal, and you take them to the border to deport them, you're going to find yourself in jail. Uh, there are a lot of federal laws that come into effect here, and this is pure federal responsibility. The issue is the federal government needs to get off its butt and do their jobs. You know, we had a, a cockfighting ring up in, in San Jacinto County this week where they arrested seven illegal immigrants. ICE wouldn't do anything about it. You know, they, they just they wouldn't do it. They, they just said, nope, don't bother us. All right, Holly, you've looked at this. Well, I, I think there is a problem in oh, yeah. conflict with the, with the federal uh, enforcement. But this, you know, this is another attempt, I think, to draw attention to the problem. And especially now, we talked in the earlier segment about, you know, the world stage. We are effectively waging a proxy world war at this point. Now, more than ever, it is essential that we get control of that southern border yeah. and who's coming across. And that matters. You know, I know Marcus is worried about, you know, what we're doing overseas. 
overseas, but that matters right here at home to people who live here both legally or as undocumented immigrants. Um, safety is going to be number one. And, uh, you know, kudos to the state for trying to draw more attention to it. Not sure it'll hold up, though, constitutionally. Bill, no surprise to you or to anybody here. 98% of our viewers, whether it's constitutional or not, think it's a good idea. Uh, thoughts? So I feel confident it's not constitutional, number one. I think what Bob said about it is exactly right. And this is a bad idea from a policy standpoint. The last thing I want our police officers doing when we only solve 60% of murders in the city of Houston, when we only solve 25% of rapes, when we only solve 8% of burglaries, Say is it. running around chasing you know, people that are here illegally, 99% of whom are doing nothing but trying to get a job someplace. This is, this is bad law, it's bad public policy, and I'm sorry, audience, if it makes you feel better, but it's not a good idea. All right, Marcus, I mean, maybe this is just our collective cry for do something, yeah, do something. Yeah. So you, you're absolutely right, and Bob stated the best. Um, we wouldn't, this legislation would not have to be presented if the federal government were doing their, their job. Uh, and that's unfortunately not the case. And Holly, yes, I, well, actually, no. My greatest concern is not about what's happening overseas. I stated the danger and the perils that I believe, but my greatest concern with, I, I have rejected our funding of Ukraine, just like I reject our funding for this, this, this war in, between Israel and Palestine. I think America's problems need to be first and foremost. We have more fentanyl deaths in this nation than Ukraine and the Israeli-Palestine conflict combined. And part of that has to do with the border. And so I, I, I think we should be taking care of home. There's a saying when you get on the airplane that the stewardess, that the flight attendant tells you, when the oxygen mask comes down, you put yours on first before you try and help someone else. Good point, and Sue, it's, it's, it's a tough one to throw, because to me, I'm watching this president talk about national security and how important it is for us to be over there and spend billions over there when we've got the green light and the vacancy sign and a porous border. I mean, that's a, that's a tough thing to defend, in my opinion. Well, it is, and so um, the person that brought the, it's a, it's a horrible idea. We don't want our local police running around, and then, and then where, you, where are you going to put them when you catch them? Right. You know, and then how are you going to transport them where, it, it, I mean, it's just, it's a terrible idea, and we've gone through this before. What he should have been saying when he was up there was saying, hey, the federal government needs to get ICE, needs to get the people th to come down here. But to throw a crazy idea like that out there, make people think this can actually happen and be effective, is really irresponsible. Because this is not effective, um, and, and if it, it, it can't happen, and you just give people a false sense of there's a solution. That's not the solution. Dan Crenshaw has suggested that any money for Ukraine and Israel needs to be topped with money for, and direction at the border. You got 20 seconds, Bob. Here's the attention getter on this. 18 people from the Middle East were apprehended just in the Eagle Pass area just this month. 600,000 gotaways came across the border last year. How many potential terrorists are in that group? Wow. Well, We'll be watching it. Okay, up next, a sobering assessment of our city's financial condition. Bottom line, Houston, we've got a money problem. With the ongoing structural deficits and all of the liabilities that are outstanding, we're in for a rude awakening in the next few years. And not just the taxpayers, but the next administration, the next council, um, everybody's going to be feeling it. Urban Reform founder and Fox 26 contributor Charles Blaine reacting to a scathing assessment of our city's financial well-being issued by the Greater Houston Partnership. The organization representing the business community labels the $400 million surplus reported by outgoing Mayor Sylvester Turner as, quote, budgetary sleight of hand. That's because the city has enormous liabilities, including an estimated $3 billion in deferred maintenance on roads, at least a half billion dollars owed firefighters in back pay, and obligations totaling at least $3 billion related to water infrastructure. Panel, beyond tarnishing the legacy of the current city council and Mayor Turner, the structural budget deficit called out by the partnership will demand some very tough choices by the next mayor. And if you look in that report in the footnotes, there's Bill King down there a few times. <laughs> Bill, you want to comment on this? 
You know, I don't like to think of myself as I told you so kind of person, <laughs> but I guess I really well, am because no. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, by the way, this report was written by John Diamond, who is an economist at the Rice Baker um, uh, Institute. So this is not just a partnership saying this. Uh, and, and John, I thought, did a great job of sort of laying out the problems. Look, this predates Sylvester Turner. I want to just say that, uh, make that perfectly clear. This is a structural deficit we've been running for a long time at the city of Houston. And it is a function of not spending things on the priorities that we need to be spending them on. Um, and, and by the way, the report also clearly lays out that we have not solved our pension problems, notwithstanding the you know, great hullabub that, uh, from, from Sylvester that that's been solved. It was progress towards getting a solution. It was not the solution. There's still problems mm -hmm. in that area. And the next mayor is going to have a real problem unwinding this. Um, I'm becoming increasingly convinced that one thing we need to do is stop spending as much of our sales tax to Metro as we're currently spending. Wow. Um, the city of Houston <laughs> is giving up about seven or eight hundred million dollars a year of its sales tax revenue to Metro, who has 40 percent fewer riders than it did in 1998. You know, maybe we ought to think about not sending all of that money over to Metro. Or uh, any. <laughs> Marcus Davis, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to throw this question to you this way. At the Breakfast Club, you've got a menu. And if your menu items that are not making money, you make strong decisions. You've got a decision to make. Am I going to keep those on the menu or am I going to take care of serving the rest of these that keep everybody employed and get the job done? There, there, there is a practice in restaurant to look at what your highest revenue generators are and what your lowest performers are. And, and included in that, even if it generates revenue, which one generates revenue but not the profit margin? So you have to do that assessment and then you have to rearrange uh, your menu ba based on that. So, I, I, and that's, that's, that's for any, any and every business. You have to see where we're productive and where we're not productive. We have to see where the, where, where the bleeding is and you got to put a plug in it. And then you got to find a way to build re more revenue. Speaking of building more revenue, if we're going, if we're go and speaking of the deficit, if we're going to adhere to what the GHP has, has put out, then we got to roll the clock back. Because when the vote for the firefighters came up, the GOP, I mean the GHP, put out a letter stating this is fiscally dangerous for our nation, and we do not, I mean for our city, and we do not <laughs> encourage this vote because it will be detrimental financially for the city, and we didn't adhere to that. If we're going to pay attention to what what what's being said, Moody put out a report bef uh, before that when Ron Green was controller that said, hey, you've got to find another source of revenue, and we didn't do it. Want to hear from Sue on this in overtime? Just ahead, you saw it here first in the face of overwhelming evidence of contamination. The state of Texas demands a hard second look at the affordable housing complex literally surrounded by toxic ground. All the beautiful places in Houston to build something, why would you build it around all these potential environmental risks? I don't, I don't get it. If the Texas, you know, department pulls the tax credits because they determined that they were misled, then this whole thing's going to blow up and be in bankruptcy. Our own Bill King discussing the gravity of the latest development regarding the Houston Housing Authority's 800 Middle Street project. The controversial complex for low-income residents is being built on land surrounded by deeply contaminated ash landfills and a former state Superfund site. This week, the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs ordered an independent environmental reevaluation. This after Fox 26, that's our station, aired shocking visuals of toxic ash running 30 feet deep exposed during the construction process. Panel almost simultaneously, City Council voted to move the deeply contaminated property in and around the shuttered Velasco trash incinerator plant into the city's quasi-governmental land bank. This after half a century of doing absolutely nothing to clean up the mess. Holly, you've been reporting on this too and some good reporting. Thank you. You know, the more we learn about this situation, the more disturbing it is. Now we have not one, but two state agencies uh, demanding some action here. We've got violations from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, plus the uh, state demanding a second evaluation with a different uh, environmental consultant. The other big concern that uh, we're going to be looking at is what went on those bond applications because the city took, uh, or the Houston Housing Authority took about $80 million in bonds, and on those bonds, they 
represented that there was no pending litigation. When there was, they also represented that there was no contamination within 300 feet. These are clear violations of the standards, and the city effectively admitted that when they moved to transfer that site to the Houston Land Bank. Um, uh, if they kept it under their own uh, jurisdiction, they would not be able to apply for EPA grants for cleaning up. So by moving it over to this land bank, now they can apply, but uh, EPA will not give those grants to the uh, party that's responsible for the contamination in the first place. They have a big problem on their hands. Kind of like the partnership, better late than never. <laughs> this is belated vigilance, <laughs> okay. right? Sue Lovell, uh, you know, I got to give you credit. You pointed this out to me for the last couple of years as something that yes. you have publicly said was immoral. It is immoral. You know, sometimes it's the little mistakes. The, the city moved this over to the land bank simply because they didn't want the liability and they wanted to start kind of covering up like this is really true. What they did is they revealed and admitted that, yeah, we're moving this contaminated property right next to where we're building, you know, a housing for hundreds and hundreds of, of um, families. And by admitting that now, um, it, it, it set off a whole string. What it said is, yeah, we were lying. We know we were lying. We've admitted we were lying. And everything that you said about happening here is true. The biggest thing is, this is immoral. And you know, Union Pacific, that the city's just been, been pounding on about how immoral they were and how it was wrong. Well, guess what, city? You're becoming, you're becoming the new Union Pacific. What you are doing is more evil than what Union Pacific did to the fifth ward, what you are doing in the second ward, moving those families in, in a super fun site. Bob? This story illustrates the, the value and the necessity of real journalism. By shining the light and sounding the sirens on this and standing firm on it with repeated reporting on the same thing, you forced the state to take another look at it. You forced the other news media in town to take a look at it. And you probably saved lives. Uh, Bob, that's, I you appreciate did. that. Marcus Davis, you know, you heard the fifth, fifth Ward comparison. Right. And, you know, mm. they, they've said that there was no other land. I think that's a big crock. Uh, yeah. And th there was other land to put this on. You've been watching this unfold. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think as as Sue and as you mentioned, this is you know belated vig vigilance, right? It, it, you came after the party was over and wanted to crank it back up. Fortunately, hopefully, there will be lives that will be saved by it. But we have, you know, people who are, are electing these folks to office got to pay attention to the ones that are elected and the ones that are appointed to these other offices. By the way, I did notice that you know. He had an a interview. Charles had an interview. Well, when are we going to get our interview? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mean, <laughs> equal time, equal right, time. Right. Real, real quick, Bill. I mean, you know, uh, you, you've heard all of this, and, uh, and you've been watching this. It's so, halfway built. Yeah, so, you know, what I, what I find, found pretty amazing about this was how candid the city was in admitting how deeply polluted this contaminant this land is in this agenda item to move it over to the land bank. Now, <laughs> look, if that helps them get money and clean it up, I'm happy for them. Uh -huh. I hope that it works. It doesn't sound like that ought to work uh -huh. to me, but I don't really <laughs> know that area of the law very well. But, you know, this is, folks, this is across the fence line. I mean, this is not like, you know, a block down the street. I mean, it is across the fence line from where they're building this project. You know, this was a, a city incinerator that was operated from the 30s, I think, through 1969. Mm -hmm. There's 30 feet of buried ash here. This is something the city of Houston did. Not anybody that's there now. It was done decades ago, but we've done nothing to clean it up. All right, we're going to leave it there and keep our eye on it, okay? Up next, a deep dive into Harris County's troubled 2022 election, finds incompetence and blunders, but generates no recommendation for a do vote. Welcome back. At long last, an official report card has been issued for Harris County's deeply problematic 2022 election. As expected, it's not pretty. The audit by State Secretary of State Jane Nelson confirmed multiple meltdowns, including failure to provide polling places with enough ballots, failure to properly train election workers, and deep discrepancies in the number of registered voters reported to the state. Other stuff too. Panel, while describing the election as poorly executed, Secretary Nelson did not overtly determine the deficiencies altered any race outcomes. 
Holly, you've done some good reporting on this, too. So, so, so what do you make of this report? Well, I don't think there were any surprises here, but it did reinforce the, the idea that we've been talking about for the past year that the county actually violated state law in what they provided to the polling places. So they're supposed to provide 125% uh, of turnout in the last corresponding election. They did not do that. They came up with their own methodology. But what's interesting in this report, if you read through the 147 pages, um, they even using their own methodology. So the Secretary of State has this mathematical uh, calculation where they <coughs> use their methodology. They still undersupplied many of these polling sites uh, by significant amounts. That is a violation of state statute, but the problem is there's really no enforcement mechanism. Um, you know, there may be some misdemeanor charges that could be associated with it. Uh, the Secretary of State's office doesn't really have the authority to do anything about it other than perhaps at some point uh, executing administrative oversight over the county's elections if it continues. 20, 30 seconds each. We deserve better, don't we? Question mark. Bill King. Yeah, you know, there's an old saying around government that don't ever attribute anything to fraud or conspiracy that can ex be explained by incompetence and sloth. <laughs> and, and I think this is one of those cases. When you read through that report, it's just, it was just mismanagement. Now, let me say this. Running an election in Harris County is difficult. Uh, we have the longest ballot in the United States of America. It's a huge county, a huge number of people. We have to have two pieces of paper go through the machine. We're the only county in the state that has to do that. So this is not a not an easy thing to do. But taking it away from groups that knew how to do it, giving it to new people, they were just asking for trouble, and they got it. Yeah, I mean, look, this was advertised to us, this administrator, as this is going to vastly increase efficiency. Just didn't happen, Marcus. Yeah, it, it didn't happen. And as, as Holly mentioned, this, this report... It was great, but we knew this, right? We felt it, right? We were the ones at the polls uh, that saw it and that felt it. And we hear, you know, what's your point? We speculated on it uh, week after week. And, you know, going back to the administrator, that, that's, that's not, it's not possible. I mean, you've got to be a hell of a manager and leader to come in and take over and in your first go round, make it successful. It was irresponsible to take it away from the people that knew how to do it. The ladies I'm, who were elected I'm, I'm, to do the it. The ladies yeah. that were elected to do it, and I am happy that they are in control and in mm -hmm. charge now. 15 seconds. So if, tech, if Harris County was a state, it'd be the 25th largest state in the country. It's a huge election thing. 9,000 people more voters than were reported, 3,600 more mail ballots than were reported. There, you know, some of these races were 1,000 to 2,000 different. Yeah, Sue Lovell's going to guarantee a better job from the elected folks, right? <laughs> hey, vindication. I don't know. <laughs> Still to come with just two weeks and change until the November election, we've got fresh intel on what Houston voters care most about. Welcome back. 16 days out from the November election, and we have fresh polling from the University of Houston's Hobby School regarding voter priorities in the Bayou City. As expected, crime control topped the list among 82% of likely voters, with a whopping 84% calling for the addition of at least 600 police officers. In a dead heat for runner-up, on the priority list, improving streets and boosting the economy, both drawing 67%. Panel, perhaps most significantly, slightly more than half of voters polled believed Houston is heading in the wrong direction. I know that worries you, Marcus. Uh, it, it does, and I'll tell you why it worries me. Well, first of all, half of Houston believes that it's going in the right direction, right? right? Uh, what worries me is th that we're talking about the half that believes it's going in the wrong direction. What worries me also is, and this is no disrespect to the, to the people who did the, the research, <clears throat> But if you can't verify how people came to these conclusions, then I don't know how valid the research is. I'm not saying crime is not a problem in the city of Houston. I think commercials run over and over and over again about crime in the city of Houston play a part in the psyche that says it's our number one issue. Mm. I think that we have drilled it into the, the Houston citizens, either through people who are running for mayor, through com conversations on talk shows, that this is our number one issue. I'm not saying, again, crime is very important, but I don't know that those statistics that were turned out didn't take into account how many people have been infected with 
campaign runs. Yeah. You know, I'm coming back from the UH game, which was an enormous spectacle. I mean, it was great yesterday. Uh, maybe not the outcome. Terrible outcome. call. They got a terrible call. They got, they got, we got cheated. Oh, on the way, <laughs> cheated. Cheated. But on the way, I saw three of my fellow human beings who were just in, just in crisis, obvious crisis. And there was no one coming to help them right away. You know, and I kind of worry. I said, like, it's kind of a tale of two Houston's. I mean, what do you think of these numbers, Sue? You know our people. Well, you know, I, I think they're valid. I mean, it's been consistent. That's really what you've heard through this whole election cycle that it is. And I think, look, everybody's going to have a chance on November the 7th to vote. You know, um, elections have consequences. Take this very seriously. If you think the city's going in the right direction, figure out who, who you want to elect. If it's in the wrong direction, then decide who it is that can take and turn this around and make yeah. it go in the right direction. I think that, you know, we need police officers, but do we need them out in the neighborhoods? I think there needs to be a restructuring in some way of how we Amen. send our officers out into the city and, and what they do. And so, hey, elections have consequences. You're going to have a chance to turn this around. Go, Go vote. Go vote. I think there's a dis disconnect between what these polls are saying and what voters do. When we look at the county election in the last election, crime was number <laughs> one on that. But yet the voters still left everything status quo. And that, and that goes to the point that, that I'm making, right? If, if, if the majority of the candidates have been talking about the economy of the city, then I'm sure that that poll would reflect it. If they had been talking about infrastructure, you'd have people talking about infrastructure. I think we have to pay attention to the message. Bill, at a fundamental level, uh, what does history tell us about who's actually going to vote in terms of demographic and age? It's, 30 um, seconds. Yeah, the, the voter turnout's about 20% in city elections. And it's, it's older Houstonians, primarily older white and black people that go vote. Um, it's, the, the turnout is really sort of embarrassing. Uh, for, in, in the 2019 t uh, runoff, it was 18%. But I'm going to tell you, this, this, this finding that a majority of people think Houston's had the wrong is very significant. I've never seen that before in a poll. Okay. <clears throat> Still ahead, Sidney Powell, Trump attorney and perpetrator of the big lie pleads guilty to election crimes in a Georgia courtroom. We have testimony of different workers admitting that they were trained how to uh, dispose of Trump votes and uh, add to Biden votes. Sidney Powell, former Trump lawyer and architect of the discredited stolen election conspiracy, has pleaded guilty to six counts of election subversion in Georgia and will be sentenced to six years of probation. Panel, the charges against Powell were reduced from felonies to misdemeanors in exchange for her agreement to testify in future trials, including that, presumably, of former President Trump. Bill, what do you make of this? Um, it's significant. She'll also lose her law license, by the way, because of this, which is very consequential. Um, look, I tell people all the time, the, the, I, the, the narratives of voter suppression and voter fraud are partisan narratives to explain why neither one of these parties can, lose, can win elections on a consistent basis. If you're telling the American people that, hey, you know, the other side is so awful, they're going to destroy the country, and then you can't win an election, we've well, got to come up with an excuse for why that's not working. And it is, if you're a Republican, it's voter fraud, and if you're a Democrat, it's voter suppression. You know, the reason they're not winning elections is because the message that they're delivering to the American people are not what the Americans want to hear. You know, they want more moderate policies and to get off these extremes. And so you have to come up with an excuse, and the excuse is fraud and suppression. Accountability, Marcus? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I would have to say that there is somewhat... Uh, some sort of accountability, but I did. I, I do take issue with the with, with the sentencing, right? And I understand you're doing it because you wanted to talk. But you know this this scandal of election fraud, getting six years when you see the the what 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 the the outcome, the tentacles, and when you see the leaves, the branches that came from this message, what it caused, it ultimately led, led to January 6. I just I just I just. Yeah, um, hopefully she'll bring in some great information that, that, that will warrant or justify six years probation. Because what happened to the young lady who, who accidentally voted and she didn't know she wasn't supposed to vote and she ended up getting some real time? The bottom line is tens of millions of Americans still believe this election was stolen. Fair statement, Holly? 
Oh, goodness, you put me in the hot seat on that well, one. Yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the dominoes are falling for, you know, all of those who were around Trump and promoting this narrative. Um, a lot of us got weird phone calls, you know, saying that Biden would never take office because they could prove the election was fraudulent and that was never the case. I think uh, the downside of the situation is that uh, it, it sets up a false dichotomy. So now when we do have incidents of, of uh, fraud which or problems like we had here in Harris County, you know, you can't even talk about them because then you get accused of being an election denier and you're saying, no, we want to make sure that our elections or ones that the people have faith in. And uh, this, this whole thing has been just devastating for the American confidence in elections. That's what we all want. Somebody give Rudy Giuliani a towel. <laughs> <laughs> Still to come, banning the ability of Texas employers to mandate vaccination. It's happening soon at the state capitol. Welcome back on tonight's edition of Texas. The issue is airing at 945 right here on Fox 26. We dive into the crusade at the state capitol to ban vaccine mandates by private employers. No, no, it, no Texans should be fired um, for whatever reason, whether it's religious or conscience or medical for not getting a vaccine. And right now we have employers in the state of Texas that are that, that are that are firing or as a condition for continued employment, telling their employees you have to get a vaccine. Panel, we close today with some breaking news. The Houston Chronicle is endorsing John Whitmire in the race for mayor. Just as a decade old audio tape has emerged in which his closest rival, Sheila Jackson Lee, can be heard brutally dressing down her staff members in a ferociously profane display of bullying, wholly unfit for a Sunday morning audience. We're not playing it, or perhaps any audience that could possibly include children or pastors. Now, some of you have heard it. Uh, Sue, what do you make of this? Uh, the Whitmire endorsement? Yeah, actually, that's fine. I, actually, Either. I'm surprised. I don't think it has anything to do with the tape. I think John's made his case that he, he's the person with the skill sets and the, um, and the knowledge to, uh, to be the next mayor and, and move this city forward. Um, the, the tape with Sheila, I, I, I'm, I've been around a long time. Why it came out now, right before early vote, you know, they haven't denied it, which is something big, but this is just usual, you know, political shenanigans. Thoughts, Bill? Um, I listened to the tape and I was shocked. And, and as my children will quickly tell you, I'm, not, I'm known to drop an expletive from time to time. But this is, this is first, every profane word I know is used in about, about 90 seconds. And secondly, it's young staff people that she's, you know, subjecting to this just, you know, incredible dressing down. Like, I, I've managed thousands of employees in my life. I've never come close to talking to one of them the way she talked to these two young people. Okay, we're going to talk more on overtime. Okay, thanks to this week's panel, and thank you for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next on Fox News Sunday with Shannon Breen, and we'll keep talking here with Watch Your Point Overtime, streaming live on fox26houston.com and on our Facebook page. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week. And everybody together, go, go Astros! Go.